this lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video, we're going to continue our examination of Plato's Phaedo, and specifically, we're going to focus on the major arguments he gives for the immortality of the soul. Now, we should recall to ourselves from last time the basic argumentative structure that Plato uses in the Phaedo. So he said his first task is to show that the soul can exist independent and apart from the body. And as I talked about in our previous video, one of the arguments he uses to do this is the cyclical argument. He says that, well, because every state comes from its opposite, and because death is a state of life, then our state of being alive, where our soul and our body are united, must have been preceded by the state of death where the soul and body are separate. But of course, if that's the case, if that state preceded our current one, then in fact it must be the case that the soul can exist without the body. It must have been the case that before we were brought to the state of life, before our, our body and soul were united, it must have been the case that the soul was doing something by itself um, without the body. And you might wonder, well, what is that something the soul was doing? And in fact, we're going to get further insight to that in this video. So this is one argument, the cyclical argument, is one argument he uses to show the soul can exist apart from the body. But in this, in this video, we're going to look at a second argument that Plato also uses to establish that claim, and it's called the argument from recollection. Now, this argument is helpful because not only because it gives further evidence or support for this claim that the soul can exist without the body, but also gives us further insight into what the major theme of the dialogue. Remember that the major theme that Plato has been pursuing is that the true philosopher should look forward to death because it is only through death that the culmination of the philosopher's purpose can come about. It's only after our death that we can attain perfect knowledge of the forms. And the argument from recollection is going to give us further um, explanation or understanding of how that process occurs. Okay, so let's take a look at the argument. And to see the foundation of the argument, we can look at the following passage where Cebes um, questions Socrates about a doctrine that he talks about in a number of places, not just in this dialogue, but in other dialogues as well. This doctrine known as the theory of recollection. So the passage goes, Furthermore, Socrates, Cebes rejoined, Such is also the case, if that theory is true, that you are accustomed to mention frequently that for us learning is no other than recollection. According to this, we must at some previous time have learned what we now recollect. This is possible only if our soul existed somewhere before it took on this human shape, so according to this theory too, the soul is likely to be something immortal. So Plato has this theory of recollection, and what it is is really just a theory of learning. So you might say that, well, how do we come to know new things? You might say, well, the mind is empty in some respect, and then because someone tells you um, or teaches you something or you experience something, then the mind is filled up with something it didn't have before. But what Plato is going to claim is that at least the sort of learning he's talking about, learning which approaches true knowledge of the forms, doesn't occur like that at all. In fact, the knowledge by which we understand the forms is not a knowledge where the mind is empty and then is filled in some way, but the knowledge is already there in the mind in some sense. And so what we need to do is not to gain the knowledge per se, but we need to recollect it. We need, we need to remember what we have previously forgotten. And, of course, you can see the direction this is going, because if learning is, about the forms is a, a sort of recollection, and recollection or remembering always refers to the past, then there must have been a time in our past, presumably before our birth, bef before we came to exist as a living being, there must have been a time in our past when we had that knowledge. And you can see how this would lead to the claim, which for Plato it does, that the soul can exist by itself before our birth and has knowledge of the forms that in this life we need to work toward recollecting. So that's the basic shape of the argument. But there are two important questions to really understand how this is supposed to work. There are two questions that we need to think about. So what exactly is it 
what sort of learning or what kind of knowledge requires the soul to exist prior to his association with the body? And I suggested, you know, it's the forms because it's not the case that all sort of things that we know, right? So, for instance, there's not a form of a historical event, right? The American Revolution was in 1766. That's something we have to learn through history. It's not like uh, the form of circularity or something like that. So it's only certain sorts of knowledge we need to recollect. And how does, like, what is the soul doing prior to its association with the body that makes such learning possible? And through examining Plato's argument for recollection, we're going to see how he answers these questions. Okay, so let's get to the argument itself. And I've outlined it here. We're going to take it premise by premise, um, again, because there are some technical concepts here. So premise one of the argument from recollection. It is possible to understand the perfect form of some concept, refer to this as S for perfect form, uh, uh, excuse me, refer to this as F for perfect form, from encountering the imperfect instances of F. Okay, now I just want to say one thing before I dive into explaining what this premise means. If you have not watched the video on death knowledge and Plato's theory of the forms, this is going to be a bit difficult to understand because this argument, as we've seen already, does rely on the fact that you know what the theory of the forms is. So if you haven't watched that video, I would recommend going, pausing this, going back and watching that first. Okay, but if you, with a basic understanding of the forms in place, we should recall to ourselves that for Plato, what the forms are are just the perfect, um, ideal essences of things. So we, the example we use is we encounter all sorts of round objects that we call circles, but none of them are really perfect circles. Yet we have this definition of a perfect circle in our minds. It is a closed figure in which all the points are equidistant from the center. And so he says, well, what it really means to know what a circle is, is not just to know about the round things we see in our experience, which actually don't live up to that definition. In, even if, if in very, very small ways, we've never really encountered a perfect circle. Rather, what it means to know about a circle is to know that perfect definition, to know the perfect essence of circularity. And all premise one is saying is that we can, through encountering the imperfect instances of something, come to know the perfect forms. Now, this doesn't happen immediately, right, because... Um, you know, we don't encounter perfection in our experience. But all he's saying is that we can begin the process of knowing the perfect forms through seeing imperfect things, through, through seeing imperfect circles, through seeing imperfect instances of beauty or justice and etc. And of course, the process by which this happens is the theory of recollection. And so we see Plato here beginning to explain a little bit about what he means by this theory of recollection. So, he says, we surely agree that if anyone recollects anything, he must have known it before. For instance, when a man sees or hears or in some other way perceives one thing and not only knows that thing, but also thinks of another thing, of which the knowledge is not the same but different, are we not right to say that he recollects the second thing that comes into his mind? So Plato's talking about a certain kind of memory prompting or remembering. It's a sort of memory prompting or remembering that happens to us all the time, right? You see a picture of something, like maybe a picture of yourself on vacation, and instantly you're transported back to that vacation. Or one of the most common ones, because actually our sense of smell is the most directly tied to our memory, you may have encountered a smell that um, is so strongly tied to some experience in your past that you're instantly transported there. Right. So for me, right, if I'm out, if I'm out cutting the grass or it's early in the morning and the grass is still a little wet, I'm like instantly transported back to the football practices of my youth. It's there's a certain smell that the grass has and it just instantly transports me back there. So that's what he means by a sort of recollection. And he gives other sorts of examples. He says, and I think this example is very instructive. Imagine that you have two lovers, right, two, two significant others. And let's say they share some sort of, um, let's say they're not together anymore, but let's say they share, for whatever reason, they shared some sort of object. Like he gives an example of a liar or a piece of clothing. And whenever they see a liar or a garment or anything else that their beloved is accustomed to use, they know the liar and the image of the boy to whom it belongs comes into their mind. 
So if you have two friends, two lovers, two significant others, and there was some common object between them, when they see that object, instantly their mind is transported to the person that they love. Now, the reason I think this example has a deeper layer is because, to some extent, although the forms are not persons, Plato sees us having a certain sort of attraction to the forms. He thinks the human mind is not simply satisfied with the imperfect sense experience that we have every day. Instead, what the human mind is drawn toward is perfection. We're striving to perfection. We want to know true justice, true beauty. At least, especially the, the philosopher wants to know those things. And so, if you think about, you know, you come across a piece of clothing that a, some, a friend or a significant other uh, used to have, you know, it's not enough that you see that piece of clothing, that you touch it, or that you see a picture of them. That's good, but what you're really longing for is that person in and of themselves. And Plato sees the mind of the same way. We can be reminded of perfection in the forms through the imperfect things we see, but the mind is not satisfied there. It's going to want to constantly strive to know those things. Human beings are in a very real and distinct and essential way oriented toward perfection. Okay, so we see basically how this theory of recollection is supposed to work. We see something imperfect, and it's going to remind us of the perfection of the forms. And specifically, we can break this down into there's always a cause of recollection, and there's the thing recollected. So there's the clothing, or the picture, or the smell, right? That's the cause for the recollection. And then there's a thing you remember. There's the person you love, or in my example, the, the football practice that comes to mind. So there's the cause for re recollection and the thing recollected. Okay, now, importantly, as I've been suggesting, this doesn't just apply to people we love or experiences we've had. It does apply to the forms. And to make this case, he uses the example of the form of equality. So he says, must, not, must one not of necessity also experience this? To consider whether the similarity to that which one recollects is deficient in any respect or complete. So the first thing he says, well, um, when you are engaged in recollection, when there's that cause of your recollection, is that cause, is it imperfect or complete? And of course we said it's imperfect. The picture of the person you love is nice, but it's not that person themselves. So there's this dissimilarity between the cause of recollection and the thing recollected. And he applies this to the form of equality. So he says, consider, he said, whether this is the case. We say that there is something that is equal. I do not mean a, a stick equal to a stick or a stone to a stone or anything of that kind, but something else beyond all these, the equal itself. Whence have we acquired knowledge of it? Is it not from the things we mentioned just now, from seeing sticks or stones or some other things that are equal, we come to think of uh, that other than which is different from them? So... And he then wraps up this point by saying, these equal things and the equal itself are therefore not the same. So he says, look, imagine you see two sticks which are very similar in length. You might in an offhand way say, oh, those two sticks are equal. But of course, they're not really equal. But they are remind the only way, and this is the fundamental Platonic insight. The only way, he says, you could ever label two sticks as equal that are unequal is because of this theory of recollection. It's not because the sticks are really equal, it's because they're reminding you of the form of equality. Just as the picture of your friend reminds you of the friend, and just as the uh, smell you encounter reminds you of ex uh, an experience. And notice that the, the cause for recollection in all cases is less perfect than the thing you're remembering. When I you know, experience the smell of wet grass and then transport it back to football practice. I know that experience um, is not the same. It's not as vivid as it once was. It's imperfect. And the same with the, th the forms. When you encounter the so-called equal sticks, they're not truly equal. They're reminding you of something that is equal. They're reminding you of the perfect thing. Okay, so that's the first premise. The first premise just is that we can begin to move toward the perfection of the forms, through encountering their imperfect instances. Okay, so let's look at the second premise. We can only come to understand F, the perfect form of a concept, through encountering the imperfect instances of F, 
if we already possess knowledge of f prior to encountering its perfect instances. And I've suggested this already. He says, okay, this is very weird that you can take a look at two unequal sticks and think of equality. Well, the only way that's possible is if in some sense you understand in your mind, in your soul, the perfect idea of equality. And he explains this in the following way. Is there some deficiency in there being such as the equal, or is there not? A considerable deficiency. Whenever someone on seeing something realizes that that which he now sees wants to be like some other reality, but falls short, and cannot be like that other since it is inferior, do we agree that the one who thinks this must have prior knowledge of that to which he says it's like, but deficiently so, necessarily? So you see the two sticks, which are close to equal, but not really equal. And there's a sense in which you say, wow, these are inferior instances of equality. They are striving toward equality. They're moving toward equality. They're somewhat like equality, but they're not really equality. And you might see, think that's a weird thing to say about sticks, striving toward equality. And to some extent it is, but think about, for instance, that the forms are not just about mathematical concepts, although it's easiest to understand them in mathematical concepts. They're also about moral concepts. So think about a society that um, is becoming more and more just, more and more fair, more and more equal over time, a different sense of equal, a moral equality. There's a sense in which we can say that society understands its own shortcomings, understand its perfections, and is moving, if it is moving in the right direction, toward justice, fairness, and equality. And think about the fact that we can look back over the course of history and see how some societies get more perfect, more just, more equal, and how some societies get less perfect, less just, and less equal. And how is it that we can recognize that? Well, we must have some sense, some understanding of the perfect form of justice that allows us to judge that. And what is it that reminds us of that perfect form of justice? It's seeing the imperfect forms. It's looking at actual societies in our world, seeing the ways in which they're just, seeing the ways in which they fall short, and that being a reminder of the perfect justice toward which we are all striving. And so if he's giving the example of just mathematical equality here, but you could put in any form, goodness and truth and justice and beauty. And he says, we must then possess knowledge of the equal before that time when we first saw the equal objects. To judge a society as just or unjust, we must have some knowledge of the form of justice. To judge a painting as beautiful or ugly, we must have some knowledge of the perfect form of beauty. So P2 simply says, this recollection would not be possible if there wasn't a time when we already had knowledge. There must have been a time when we already had this knowledge because that's what we're recollecting. Just like I could not recollect my experience of the football practice if I had never practiced football. The same structure always applies. Recollection requires something in the past that you're remembering. So the question then is, going to the third premise of the argument, well, when was this past time when we um, encountered knowledge of the forms? And Plato tells us it was prior to our birth. So he says, um, or the third premise of my outline of the argument is, we can only possess knowledge of F, the perfect uh, forms, prior to encountering its imperfect instances, if our soul existed prior to our birth. So why is this? This is the key point here. Because remember, he's trying to show the soul can be separate from the body. So why is it the case that the soul must have existed prior to our birth? Well, he makes a point about what begins to happen when we are born. So our sense, uh, he says, our sense perceptions must surely make us realize that all we perceive through them is striving to reach that which is equal with the capital E, but falls short. So we see, again, in our sense experience, we see everything that is imperfect. Then before we begin to see or hear or otherwise perceive, we must have possessed knowledge of the equal itself. If we were about to refer to, to, uh, if we were about to refer our sense perceptions of equal objects to it and realize that all of them were equal to be like it but were inferior. So the first point is we never see perfection in our senses and so the implication is that we could only experience perception 
without our senses, right? Our sense perceptions are uh, exactly what give us the imperfect instances. So when do we begin to hear and otherwise perceive? When do we begin to smell and see and touch and taste and hear? Well, right after birth, of course. We must then have acquired the knowledge of equal before this. It seems then we must have possessed it before birth. So if we only began to see imperfection after our birth, then in order to even recognize that as imperfection, it must be the case that before we were born, we had this knowledge of the perfect forms. And what we're going to see is that Plato is going to argue that in some sense, although not completely, when we're born, we lose this knowledge. And you might wonder why that is, right? If our soul had knowledge of uh, the form of truth and beauty and goodness and justice and equality and circularity, if it had all this knowledge, why don't we have it right now? And he says it's because when we're born, we lose that knowledge to a certain extent. And we can see sort of how this relates to his previous claims um, about the nature of the soul and its relationship to the body. If the body is a sort of prison for the soul, if the body drags the soul down, if the body just keeps the soul trapped in imperfection, we can see why once we're united with the body, that might have a deleterious effect on all the knowledge we had previously had. And so he gives a nice summary here of this point. Our present argument is no more about the equal than about the beautiful itself, the good itself, the just, and the pious. And as I say, about all those things which we mark with the seal of what it is, both when we are putting questions and answering them. And this gives us further insight into how we recover this knowledge. So we previously had knowledge of the good and the beautiful and the just and the true. And then we lose it through the process of birth. How do we regain it? Well, we start off by examining the world. But that only gives us imperfection. So how do we move beyond that? Well, remember, it's through reason. And specifically, it's through philosophy. We are first sort of pushed into gaining knowledge by seeing imperfection and wanting to know what is perfect. And so how do we come to know what's perfect? As he says, by putting questions and answering them. That just is the process of philosophical dialogue. Philosophical dialogue is what allows us to fully recover remember and recollect the, pr the perfect knowledge that we previously had. And now we can begin to see how all of this is tied up again into Plato's vision of the philosophical mission. The philosophical mission or the philosophical purpose of learning or gaining truth, which happens through dialogue in which we recover the truths that we previously had. Okay, so and for him, you might, you might say one criticism at this point is simply, well, okay, that all sound, sounds fine and well, but why do we actually need to appeal to recollection here? Right? Why can't we just say that we're all born with the knowledge of the forms? It's certainly a possibility. And if it was true, then we wouldn't need to appeal to recollection. If we didn't need to appeal to recollection, we wouldn't need to say that the soul pre-existed the body. But Plato says, no, this can't be the case, because if you ask the average person if they can define uh, or, or give an account of what is justice, what is courage. Remember all the way back to the Euthyphro, when Socrates um, encountered a Euthyphro who was very confident that he knew what, what piety was, but upon questioning could not explain it. So if we were all truly born with knowledge of the forms, then it seems that we should be able to give an account of these things. We should be able to explain them. But we can't. In, ta in fact, it takes a lifetime of philosophical questioning and careful reasoning to recover this knowledge. So the better explanation, he says, is that, look, we forget knowledge of the forms at birth, and then we recollect that knowledge later on. And so this is the conclusion he comes to. And I think a way to think about this is because it's certainly a, sort of a complicated picture. And for me, one of the most difficult aspects to understand is what does it mean to say that our soul has, in some sense, knowledge of the forms, but in another sense doesn't? Right? So in one sense, it has this knowledge because he says we're remembering it, we're recollecting it, we're recovering it. And every time you remember something, you're pulling something from your mind that was already there. So in some sense, we have to have the form of justice already within us. 
But on the other hand, as Plato just said, the average person can't give an account of justice or equality or beauty or truth or goodness. They can't fully explain these things. So in another sense, that person doesn't have that knowledge. So how is it that we explain this? What is What are we doing in the movement from not having knowledge to having knowledge? And I think the way I would explain it is this. I would say the sort of understanding that we have from birth in our soul, as Plato says it, of the forms, is what I would call an unconscious understanding. Right, so in your mind, right, there, or in your soul, as Plato would put it, there is some sort of recognition or understanding of the form of equality. Even if you, obviously as a baby or an infant or a toddler, or even um, as you become older, couldn't give a perfect account of what equality or justice is. But it's there, and it's there for you to recover. So what's the difference between this unconscious understanding our soul has from the forms at birth to the conscious knowledge that we eventually gain through philosophy and through seeking knowledge? Well, I would argue it's a sort of movement from an unconscious understanding to you being made aware of that knowledge. And this means that there's a sense in which there can be things in your mind and which in your soul which you are not aware of. And to see this point, ask yourself the following question. To know that something is true, is it enough, is it enough that you know it? Or do you also have to know that you know it's true? Do you have to be aware that you know do you have to be aware of the fact that you know this thing? And I think for Plato it's the latter. It's not enough that just in some abstract way, deep in the recesses of our mind or deep in the recesses of our soul, that we know the forms, we actually have to be aware of the way in which we have knowledge of the forms. So it's a movement from unconscious understanding to conscious knowledge, and that movement is sparked by us seeing the imperfect instances of the form. So seeing the sticks which are almost equal, the circle which is almost a circle, the society which is becoming more just, the painting which is more beautiful than other objects we see. By seeing the imperfect things, are, we are stirred, we are um, pushed to want to seek perfection, and the process of seeking perfection is using philosophy to bring our unconscious understanding into our conscious knowledge. Okay, so this is basically um, the argument, and it gets to the conclusion then that for this whole process of recollection to be true, it must be true that our soul existed prior to birth. And he explains this relatively straightforward way. When did our souls acquire knowledge of them? Um, certainly not since we were born as men. Before that then, yes. So then, Simeus, Simeus our souls also existed uh, apart from the body before they took on human form and they had intelligence. This is an important point. Because he thinks this argument not only shows that the soul existed apart from the body, but that our soul had intelligence. Because in order to understand the forms, it must have had something like the intelligence we had now. And this means that our soul before our birth is also something like the soul we still have now. And if that's true, then we can point to that soul and say, that is us. It's not just some foreign object, as I talked about in previous videos. Okay, so that's the basic structure of the argument. Now, there's a couple things to think about here. Um, and I'll be very interested to hear your comments and thoughts on this, this argument. So one thing to say is, if you disagree with Plato's theory of the forms, then obviously the argument has a rather significant um, issue. But even if we do accept the theory of the forms, um, there might be other problems as well. So, so think about P1 for a second. P1 assumes that it's possible for us to arrive at an idea of perfection from our acquaintance of, of that which is imperfect. And this would also assume that it's actually possible to have some sort of idea of what is perfect. But you might question whether that's actually the case. For instance, think about very abstract concepts like infinity. Now you might be able to give a definition of infinity, right? something that has no limit. But if you actually really start to think about that, uh, the concept of infinity, it's something that truly boggles and distresses the human mind. Um, it creates all sorts of paradoxes. It's actually very, even if you can say, yeah, I understand infinity, it's actually very hard to form an idea of it, right? Try to picture infinity in your mind. Try to even picture 
um, you know, we'll start off slower. Don't just try to picture a figure in your mind with, for instance, infinite sides. Try to picture a geometrical figure in your mind with merely a thousand sides. You can't do it. At least I can't. So you might wonder, well, what does it mean to say we could have an idea of something with, that's perfect? Is that possible? Or is this limitation simply because, as Plato would say, our soul is currently united with our body? Similar problems sometimes come up when people, will, some philosophers will say, well, before we argue about whether God exists, I actually don't think I even have an, art, an idea of God in my mind. Okay, so that would be one issue to think about. Do, can we actually have ideas of these very abstract and perfect conceptions um, which outstrip anything we, that we normally see in our experience? Also consider P2. Plato says the only way, so let's assume that we do have such ideas or can have such ideas. Plato thinks the only way we could ever come across those ideas or form those ideas is by remembering them, by recollecting them. And that we can only do that because the soul was previously with the forms apart from the body. But is that true? I mean, think about the idea of infinity again. How do you think you got that idea of infinity in your mind to the extent that you have it? Plato would say is because there's a form of the infinite. Before your birth, the soul was mingling with the forms. It was hanging out with the forms. It, it understood them. You forgot that knowledge when you were born, but now you can recollect it through philosophy. But some would say, well, wait a minute, maybe that's not the case. Maybe there's a way we can just gain our idea of infinity through experience. And I'll just show you one example of this. Uh, the philosopher John Locke, he was an empiricist philosopher, which... Um, means that he thought all knowledge came from experience. And in his view, he took a very different view from Plato about how we, come a, how we form ideas like that of infinity. So in his most famous work, he says, everyone that has any idea of any stated lengths of space as a foot finds that he can repeat that idea, and joining it to the former, make the idea of two feet, and by the addition of a third, three feet, and so on, without ever coming to an end of his addition. The power of enlarging his idea of space by further additions remaining still the same, he hence takes the idea of infinite space. So what is Locke saying? He's saying, well, it's really no mystery how we come across the idea of infinity. We just take, you know, idea of one feet, and then we add it, we double it, and then we have two feet, and we uh, add another foot to it, and then we have three feet, etc., etc. We just, our idea of infinity we get by just simply adding on to our ideas of length, our ideas of number, our ideas of size, um, and seeing that it has no limits. So for Locke, he thinks just through our normal sense experience and our ability to reflect on our ideas, we can come up with the idea of infinity. So I'll be interested to hear what you think about this. Like Plato, do you think abstract ideas like, the, like infinity or circularity or the perfect justice can only come from perfection itself? And therefore, the soul must have been separate from the body to encounter that perfection? Or like Locke, do you think we can arrive at perfect ideas just from our experience and extrapolating from that experience? So in any case, like I said, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. I will stop the video there. Uh, thank you for listening, and I will see you next time.